Poorly worded goals is a psychological safety net designed to help you avoid the disappointment of missing your goal. Salespeople with poorly worded goals keep editing themselves. They say, well, this year I'd like to make 500,000. Well, you know, 400 to 500,000. Uh, well, 100 to 500,000. Well, at least enough to pay my rent. Welcome to the Food for Thought Lunch Break with Steve Bookbinder podcast, the show that gives you things to think about when you're trying to make more sales without all the seriousness of conventional sales talks. Enjoy and learn as he makes fun of sales training, salespeople, and sales trainers, including himself, all while giving you battle-tested strategies that work. Now, here's your host, Steve Bookbinder. Thanks for finding a good spot for a working lunch. Coaching salespeople is what I do. I can't think of a better way to help you make more sales easier than a weekly 15-minute lunch break coaching session. Together, we can use your break like a mini workshop to question what you're doing, suggest things you could be doing differently, think of new ways of handling common sales challenges, and develop new skills you're going to need all in 15 minutes or less. If professional development that leads to more sales easier is your focus too, this podcast is right for you. But are you ready for this podcast? If you're in sales or sales management, you are accountable for ever rising goals, which means having a personal best every year and then breaking it again next year. No other job comes with that challenge. And it's the single biggest challenge salespeople and their teams face. Only about 20% of sales teams in any vertical reach these ever rising goals. The rest know the goals are changing, but they're not open to change. They think they already know how to sell, so they go into each year with a hope, but a failed plan. Their plan is to get different results without changing the way they sell. Those people are not really ready to make more sales yet or ready for this podcast. Why do we have to change to reach this year's higher goal and each year after that? Clearly not changing anything won't reliably produce more sales. Okay, then what should we change? The usual advice for people going after bigger goals is to work harder or work smarter and be more productive. Well, what have you already thought of working smarter? What if you're so productive they should do a reality show about your life? What if you're working harder than Superman in a kryptonite factory fighting all the supervillains in the same movie? You need a different answer to reaching ever-rising goals. If you're looking for that answer, you are ready for this podcast. I find when looking for an elusive answer, especially when I'm not even confident there is an answer, I could turn the problem on its head and suddenly an answer emerges by posing a new question. New questions redirect your attention. They, that's how you see things differently, think differently, and find new answers. For that reason, I keep finding new ways of asking myself, is there an easier way to make more sales? As a result, I found a bunch of strategies which I'll share with you, but I wouldn't have thought of any of these strategies if I hadn't first changed the way I think. Because it turns out, the way we think can mislead us. The way we think, our psychology, our emotions, our intuitions, all impact our opinion about what we need to do next. Now, couple that with a common dislike of prospecting, particularly phone uh, and email and networking and social selling. Instead, we like the part where we're already pitching our offering or renewal or upsell to a decision maker. We like it so much better that we'll tend to choose working on a low probability proposal over working on phone prospecting. Once we decide what we'll do next, we then rationalize why that is the best next thing. This is why it's so hard to be open to a new way of selling. It feels like you have already discovered the one best way, well, best for you, and there's no other way to act or think. I call that sales psychology. 
Today, we're going to talk about how sales psychology misleads you and ironically redirects us away from reaching higher goals. I'll suggest action steps you could use to overcome the effects of sales psychology. And I'll leave you today with ideas you can start this week that will launch you on your path to more sales easier. This week's question examines the most common example of how we mislead ourselves. This week's question, am I really ready to make more sales? This is a trick question. 100 out of 100 salespeople will say they're ready to make more sales, but less than 20% of sellers get more sales each year than the prior year. Financially, we all want more sales, obviously, but something goes wrong along the way. Some blame the market. I blame sales psychology, which misleads most of us until we become aware of the gravitational pull of these psychological factors on our daily behavior. Sales psychology misleads us by persuading salespeople to do five things that work against us. A, spend our time in the same way each year, even if the sales goals change. B, deprioritize what we really need to do next, especially if the next thing is something we don't want to do, even if doing the right next thing will help us next quarter or next year. C, only consider the best case scenarios, which leaves us unprepared for objections. D, occasionally judge how good or bad we are at something rather than coach ourselves daily to keep improving by measuring our performance against benchmarks and success metrics. And E, cause us to freeze like a computer that's running too many programs at once. I want you to think about how these examples of sales psychology have impacted you. Confirmation bias. Let's get this most obvious mislead out of the way first. It's the tendency to only observe the things that confirm what you already believe, making it harder to see any other point of view. Applied to sales, if we think we can't get to decision makers, we find evidence that supports that conclusion. If we think our leads stink, we find evidence to prove we're right. If we think we can't hit the goal, not my territory, not with this territory, not with our expensive offering, hey, 80% of the sellers on this team are also not hitting the goal. Well, eventually that mountain of evidence convinces us hitting the goal may be impossible, but the 20% who do hit the goal know there's always more than one way to make a sale. Find another way to sell, and all of a sudden, your territory is good, the leads are better, and the price is right. If you can't think of more than one way to do everything, consider how confirmation bias has limited your imagination. Two, too much positive thinking. Before we literally begin walking the path to our goal, we visualize it. Well, what is your visual? When you imagine yourself moving forward toward the goal, how would you describe that path? Many salespeople leave out the most important elements, all of the hurdles, challenges, and obstacles they will face along the way. For example, if you're currently really, really busy now, how will you have more time for more sales? You'd like to raise your average order value, but does that mean calling different leads, saying different things, getting new objections? You'd like to renew at a higher price, but will that lower your renewal rate? Some people think if you plan well enough, there won't be obstacles. It'll only be smooth sailing. Meanwhile, if your plan isn't entirely about overcoming obstacles, the plan will likely fail. <music> Using comfort as our guide. Consider the way we talk about obstacles. I was doing fine when all of a sudden, we describe the obstacle like a big, annoying boulder that fell off a nearby mountain blocking the middle of the road. The sight of that obstacle makes us think something is wrong. In fact, whenever there's even a little rough spot in the road causing a little friction, we use the expression, this doesn't feel right. That suggests it would have felt right if we didn't experience friction. Well, that's the wrong image. 
the right way to visualize the path to a challenging goal is that the obstacle is the path, just like in an action movie. Consider James Bond or Mission Impossible or Born Identity movies. In each case, we see the star on a mission to overcome the obstacle, which is equal and opposite. The more we think of our own mission, the going after ever rising goals mission, like action heroes think about their mission, the more resourceful and creative we'll be in solving our problems, just like they are. But when your image is walking along a smooth, flat road, there's no urgency or creativity. There's not enough momentum to crash through sound barriers, which is the most identifying trait of great salespeople. Avoidance of creative negative thinking. The mislead here is that for some reason, people don't realize the bigger the goal, the bigger and more personal the obstacles get. For example, swim a mile in a pool. There's hardly any obstacles. Now, swim the same distance across the English Channel and you'll encounter cold water, rough water, and jellyfish. I swam the English Channel in 2008 and learned how to keep swimming even though I was afraid of cold water, rough water, and jellyfish. When I launched my company in 2009, I visualized new obstacles as metaphoric cold water, rough water, and jellyfish. Cold water is anything you resist starting. Rough water is when the pressure of doing too much at once overwhelms you. And jellyfish are things that make you want to go in a new direction rather than face them head on. I adapted the same strategies I used as a swimmer to push my company through the recession. I'll be sharing these strategies with you over the next few podcasts. Don't be surprised if your obstacles are as big as your goals. It doesn't mean the obstacle is too big or you're on the wrong road. It means that you have to go into action movie mode to get past your personal cold water, rough water, and jellyfish. repeating patterns, swimming in circles. While training for the English Channel, I learned if you swim in open water, unable to see the spot you're swimming to, you'll feel like you're swimming in a straight line, but will likely swim in a circle. Why? Because one arm is stronger than the other, which over time in many strokes pulls you in that direction until you complete a circle. Well, this is true in everything we do. We tend to favor our strengths and minimize our weak side. And as a result, we keep getting better at the things we practice while getting worse at the things we're not actively developing. When we do the things we're strong at, we've always done it, it feels right. And all other ways feel wrong. This is why salespeople tend to repeat the patterns of how they begin each quarter, each month, each marketing campaign, what they track, and how they manage their time. Eventually, the ripple effects of making the same daily decisions the same way day after day causes us to end in the same place we ended last year, effectively swimming in a circle. Resisting the comfort and predictability of our patterns is hard. But it's one of the most important skills that today's salespeople have to develop. We're in a new world with new ways to communicate and new things popping up every day. By this time next year, there'll be a thing that isn't even a thing yet that we're all going to be expected to be an expert in. It's important to develop the skill of avoiding swimming in a circle by recognizing our own patterns, developing our own strengths and our weaknesses and testing new ideas regularly. Sunk cost decision making. In general, people make irrational go forward decisions after they've invested time or money in their last decision. For example, spending money repairing your car may cause you to believe that you now can't sell that car. Buying an expensive dinner that includes dessert makes us think we have to eat the dessert. But we already paid for the dessert whether or not we eat it. We already sunk the repair money in the car regardless of whether or not we ever sell that car. For the same reason, salespeople often latch on to prospects that they once connected with. After investing your time and effort trying to sell this account, you just can't let go. That irrational tendency prevents us from using our time to find someone new who might be more interested. Eventually, we run out of time to find new people and are locked 
into selling to a small group of stubborn customers who still haven't bought. Meanwhile, our end of the month and quarter goals are looming like the bad guy in an action movie. But with limited options, we make the only move we can. We offer a desperate discount, which we wouldn't have done if we weren't so desperate for a new sale. Poorly worded goals. Poorly worded goals is a psychological safety net designed to help you avoid the disappointment of missing your goal. Salespeople with poorly worded goals keep editing themselves. They say, well, this year I'd like to make 500,000. Well, you know, 400 to 500,000. Uh, well, 100 to 500,000. Well, at least enough to pay my rent. Listen. You are never going to hit your goal until you commit to a specific number, which is personally important to you. For sellers, this means being specific about your total annual earnings, the quarterly goals, the monthly goals, as well as the ideal pipeline that you'll need to get you through the month and the quarter and the year, and the specific actions you need to produce that pipeline. You need goals that are specifically worded so they are meaningful to you. What are you looking to do this year professionally and personally? Specifically worded goals include benchmarks, timetables, and a recognition of the cold water, rough water, and jellyfish you will face. Now, make sure you align your time with those goals by looking at your well-written goals before looking at your calendar each morning. And finally, listening to the wrong people. Listening to the wrong people like sales trainers who used to sell without the tools we use today, or managers who never sold, or opinionated marketers who never joined sales meetings, or salespeople who keep missing their goal. For all the reasons we just mentioned, we tend to listen to anyone we agree with and ignore the rest. Meanwhile, we don't listen to ourselves even though we always know what we should have done after the fact, after it's too late. But we forget to imagine the worst case scenario in advance and then listen to ourselves predict what we should have done differently. How many times have you followed advice of someone who begins by telling you they don't know? Of course, they don't say it that way. They, they tell us, I don't know, in a way that sounds so positive, like, I'm pretty sure, translation, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I think a great way to say, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Well, usually sounds so much more confident than maybe or I don't know. I want to say, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think the way it used to work, I don't know, but more convincing this time. I guess, how good are you at your guesses? Until I know, I'm guessing you don't know. Chances are, chances are that people that say chances are don't know. Probably, that's got to be at least 50% I don't know. I've always thought, do you always think you're right? Even when you don't know? From what I've heard, who told you? Someone who doesn't really know? Others have told me. You mean others who know? I personally have never done that, but clearly I don't know. I thought I heard someone say, that's a double shot of I don't know. Everyone says, um... Does everyone include the 80% who typically miss their goal? On the other hand, we tend not to try things when people say they don't know using these phrases. I doubt that. That means you're not sure, right? I once tried that and, and it didn't work. That kind of thinking could have prevented every invention in the last 100 years. Unless things have changed since the old days. Well, of course they've changed. I wouldn't try that. This one introduces the opposite of FOMO. F-O-M-O, -O, the fear of missing out. This is F-O-T, fear of trying. Fear is a powerful barrier. On the other side of that barrier is the land of opportunity. Let me summarize today's podcast. There are two choices we make with our time every day. The choice of thinking and acting in a new way or the more common choice to delay decisions and repeat patterns. For a variety of reasons, we will talk ourselves into not trying anything new. It's only in the fullness of time that we learn what we could have anticipated at the start. If we don't change our approach to match each new goal, we will have frustration and failure. But with the right changes to the way we think about our rising goals, with new images, language, and benchmarks, we can build a realistic path to even the biggest goals. 
Here's four actions you could take this week. A, rewrite your goals as we discussed. Personally, I write my goals into 18-month sprints because so much of next year depends on this year. I recommend you write a plan that describes your sales goal for the next four quarters. The plan has to include the number of total sales that will close each quarter. Try to approximate distribution of sales by category. For example, how many big sales will close each quarter? Average size sales, small sales. If you sell more than one product or service, try to envision how much of each quarter's sales is made up of each product or service. B, ask yourself a hard question. Is this goal worthy of my time and effort? This question ensures that you picked a goal big enough to care about all year long. For this reason, don't be afraid of bigger goals. They're actually easier to accomplish than small goals to which we don't bring enough enthusiasm and resourcefulness. C, challenge yourself to be brave. Am I brave enough to tell my goal to others? Finding a way to make your big goals public is scary, but compelling. It compels you to find a way to succeed. Visualize going after your goal like an action hero finding clever ways to overcome the obstacles. And D, align your time with your goal of ongoing personal development by scheduling a specific break time to listen to our next podcast. We all need different skills today than we needed five years ago, and we need to be able to properly adapt and adopt in order to be ready for more big changes next year. For that reason, our next podcast lunch meeting will look at the question, why you need new sales skills, even if you're not a salesperson. This has been Steve Bookbinder, your sales coach. I look forward to talking to you at our next podcast. Thank you for listening to Food for Thought. To get your free sales playbook, visit dmtraining.net forward slash podcast. And be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss any of Steve's jokes and helpful resources. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next week.